Hello, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from Allery Chemistry and welcome to this video on equilibria. So this is topic 25 for the CIE, that's the Cambridge International's specification. So if you are studying the Cambridge International's um, syllabus or the qualification, then this is the perfect place to get your targeted revision material. Um, I have got the full range of year one and year two videos for the CIE specification. All of it's on Allery Chemistry YouTube channel. Please hit the subscribe button to show your support for this project. That'll be massively appreciated. Um, all of these um, videos as well, they're actually slides, PowerPoint slides, that can be purchased from my test shop. If you click on the link in the description box below, you can get a hold of them there. They're great value for money and can be used to kind of supplement your revision material um, as well. So your notes, in fact, you can use them for your notes if you wish. You can write notes against them. So, um, yeah, so they're available there. Go and have a look there for, for a little bit more information. Right, so let's make a start on this. Um, so obviously this is, this is a quite a big topic actually um it's fairly big there's a lot of content i think there's a you know there's a lot of different options here so obviously you'll find that the um all the cie topics they kind of merge together um a little bit there's a lot of overlap with some of these topics obviously this is a year two topic so um you'll find that there's an equilibria topic for year one and obviously equilibria topic for year two kind of builds on what you've learned in the year one topic if you're not sure on anything um, to do with equilibria, I strongly suggest that you go and have a look at the year one video first, um, also called equilibria, um, before we look at this button, because I'm going to make some assumptions that you know some of that stuff as well. Okay, right, so let's just kind of pick up from there then, and let's have a look at, obviously, just kind of briefly before we go into conjugate pairs, um, looking at equilibrium, obviously equilibrium is to do with reversible reactions. So there's information such as Le Chatelier's principle, which you will have seen from year one, and the reversible, obviously, general reversible reactions, and the impact of catalysts and um, concentration and pressure and temperature, what impact, if any, it has on equilibrium. So there's going to be a lot of this kind of brought in here, but just advancing it. Um, one of the ones was about acids and bases and looking at conjugate pairs. So conjugate pairs is basically um, linked by the transferring of a proton. This is obviously related to acids and bases, as I mentioned. So any species that has gained a proton, okay, remember acids are proton donors and um, bases are proton acceptors. So any species which has gained a proton is the conjugate acid and a species that has lost a proton is a conjugate base. So, like I say, you've seen this in year one about Bronsted Lowry acids and bases. So, I've written a generic equation here showing an acid and a base. So, HA is your acid, as you can see there. B is your base, and you've got BH plus and A minus. Remember, this acid will donate a proton to B to form BH plus. So, that makes an acid, and obviously the B has received the proton to make that class as a base. So HA is an acid in the forward direction, like I say, it donates the proton. Um, and A minus is a base in the reverse direction, um, as it accepts a proton from BH plus to form HA. So we definitely know that's a base. Now the conjugate pairs are is basically HA and A minus. Okay, so the conjugate acid is obviously HA in this case, and the conjugate base is A minus for these two. So these are what we call a conjugate pair. And we also have another conjugate pair here, which is the B and the BH+. Plus. So BH plus would be the conjugate acid, because it would have to donate this proton to B, or, or well, effectively the, the proton would have to be released from that to form B. So that is definitely an acid, and obviously B, in this case, would accept the proton to form BH+, plus. so that's definitely a base. So this, these are basically conjugates, and that's what we class. You might see that word kind of dotted around. So obviously water reacts with acids to form H3O+, plus, which is your conjugate acid, okay, because that's going to donate the proton, and it reacts with the base to form a conjugate base, which is OH-. minus. So you can see here we've got um, some reactions here, just as an example. So you've got your base, which is aqueous 
water and that'll form BH plus and OH minus and obviously the acid reaction with the water as well. So it's just showing you the impact of a base and an acid in terms of accepting a proton and donating a proton. So what you need to be aware of is what the conjugate bit is. So where you pair them up and make sure you're aware of it. A lot of this stuff here, like say the acid base um, reactions, um, you know, proton donor, proton acceptance, etc., is all stuff that you've done in year one. Make sure you look back at that if you're not sure what this is. Um, obviously, we're just going through um, some of the stuff for the year two content here. Okay, so still kind of sticking with the acid base reactions because a lot of these reactions are equilibrium, so that's why they kind of fit into this topic. So when they react with each other, obviously protons are exchanged, as we've seen before. So we can see in this generic example, the HA donates the proton um, to B, and obviously you're producing your positive and negative ions. So in terms of equilibrium, so remember this this is obviously an equilibrium reaction, and if we add more HA or B, so if we add more of this, then equilibrium will shift to the right to use it up, and vice versa. If we add more of this, equilibrium will shift to the left to um, to use that up. So this is obviously based around Le Chatelier's principle, um, and obviously that was done in year one. So obviously the water. Um, in this example here, behaves as a base, okay, when um, acid is added to it. And the reason why is because the water molecule is accepted a proton to form H3O+. This is also known as a hydroxonium ion or hydronium ion. It's got two words um, or two different names, should I say. So strong acids, um, anything that's a strong acid, equilibrium lies well over to the right. So you're producing loads of H plus ions. Um, weak acids don't lie too much over to the right, they kind of lie more to the left, so they're weak acids. So this was to, for example, when you looked at organic chemistry in year one, you would have seen that carboxylic acids are weak acids, the equilibrium shifts right to the left or lies well, well to the left, so you don't produce many of these ions here. Now, to simplify this a little bit further, you'll see this is obviously the, the hydroxonium ion is actually what is produced, this is what makes something acidic, um, but for simplistic purposes, we can just kind of cut the kind of H2O bit out of this and just put H+. plus. You'll see it's kind of written in various ways. H plus is fine um, because that's the ion that's obviously the important bit that makes something acidic. In reality, though, hydroxonium is the, is the true molecule that makes something acidic. So just in case you kind of see some kind of confusion around that. Right, we're going to look at, um, obviously we're looking at acids and bases here and looking at equilibrium. So the natural thing to kind of move on to is pH because obviously that's strongly linked with, with acids and bases. So we're going to, there's quite a bit of maths in this topic here. There's a lot of equations and different formulas as there generally is anyway with chemistry. But obviously this is physical chemistry so you're going to have a lot of um, you know formulas in this. But pH is basically a logarithmic scale that measures the concentration of H plus ions in solution. Okay, so um, you, those of you who have done um, maths, again, if you do maths, you've probably heard of a logarithmic scale. Um, if you haven't, if you don't study maths, for example, um, then don't worry, there's a calculator, thankfully, that will kind of massively help you here, as you'll see in a moment. Um, but the pH scale ranges from 0 to 14. 0 being very acidic, 7 being neutral, 14 obviously being very basic. You'll, you'll know this already. The equation, though, is the important bit. So pH is minus log to the base 10 of multiplied by the concentration of H plus ions. So pH can be calculated when we know the concentration of H plus ions that exist in solution. So let's look at an example here where we're going to calculate the pH of 0.03 moles per dm cubed of hydrochloric acid. So here we are, hydrochloric acid is a type of acid obviously, it's a strong acid. So our assumption is that it dissociates fully, basically all of the HCl molecules dissociate to produce H plus ions and Cl minus ions. And so this means that the concentration of HCl molecules in the first place equals the concentration of H plus ions. Okay, so we assume that they are the same. So we can use the equation um, to work out the pH. And the equation is pH equals minus log of H plus, and the concentration of H plus is 0 0.03, so we get a pH of 1.52. 
So the concentration of hydrogen ions can also be calculated when we know the pH as well. So we can kind of go the opposite way. So let's have a look. So let's calculate the concentration of hydrogen uh, or calculate the concentration of hydrogen ions of nitric acid with a pH of 1.7. So we're kind of working backwards here. So to help, I'm going to put a picture of a calculator. There we are. Okay, so normally when you're looking at log, so say if you've got pH is minus log H plus, you would hit obviously minus and then hit that button where it says log and then just put in the concentration of H plus. But when we want to work out the um, concentration of hydrogen ions, we have to kind of, well, we have to rearrange the equation. So the concentration of H plus ions is basically the, um, it's like the inverse log of so it's 10 to the minus pH so that's what that 10 means now in terms of what you hit in the calculators you hit the shift button at the top you hit the log button that will give you the 10 bit and then this box here will start to flash uh, and then what you do put what you put in there is minus the pH they've given you which is 1.7 now you should get 0 0.020 moles per dm cubed when you do that so this is the way in which we use the pH equation to work out the concentration of ions, or we can work out the pH. Okay, so obviously we've looked at how we work out the pH of acids. Let's just look at some other types of acids. So far we've looked at um, obviously HCl, which is what we call a monoprotic acid. In other words, one molecule of HCl will produce one H plus ion. Um, some acids can donate more than one proton though, and they're called polyprotic acids. Uh, polyprotic or polybasic depending on what we're looking at so here like I say nitric acid is a monoprotic um, or monobasic um, substance depending on what it's obviously reacting with so here one mole of HNO3 will produce one mole of H plus ions sulfuric acid is a diprotic or dibasic um, molecule so this is one mole of sulfuric acid will basically produce Two moles of H plus ions because obviously it's H2SO4 and phosphoric acid is triprotic or tribasic depending on what it's reacting with so one mole of phosphoric acid will produce three moles of H plus ions so just be aware of these because obviously the concentrations of some of these these are all what we class as strong acids but the concentration of the actual molecule will not be, especially for di and triprotic, will not be the same as the concentration of the number of hydrogen ions they produce, because one of these can actually produce three times the amount of H plus ions um, as um, the number of molecules of this. So it, it make sure you're aware of that when you do your calculations. We'll, we'll go through some examples later. Okay, so let's look at the calculation of the pH of some of these strong acids that we've seen there. Now, when we calculate the pH of strong acids, we've got to make sure that they dissociate fully. That's the assumption that we make, okay, when we're looking at these. So that's, obviously, that's quite important. So for monoprotic acids, obviously, hydrochloric acid is an example. Nitric acid is an example of a monoprotic. Now, these will dissociate to produce one H plus ion for every acid molecule. And so this means, actually, we can just say that the concentration of the acid is going to be the same as the concentration of H plus ions. So for example, if we're looking for the pH of 0. say the pH of 0. 0.25 moles per dm cubed of hydrochloric acid, um, then we can basically make the assumption that the concentration of H plus ions equals the concentration of acid, and then we can put that into the pH equation and get a pH of 0. 0.6. So diprotic acids, so an example would be sulfuric acid, so H2SO4. So these produce two H plus ions for every acid molecule. Okay, so this means that the concentration of the acid will equal two times the concentration of the H plus ions. Okay, so we've got two lots of H plus ions. So that's the ratio that we're looking at here. So for example, the pH of 0 0.25 moles per dm cubed of sulfuric acid, basically the concentration of the acid is equal to, obviously, because the, the one acid molecule of a diprotic acid will produce two um, H plus ions, so that's why I've got the two there. So in other words, 0 0.25 moles per dm cubed of acid will produce twice as many 
H plus ions as a concentration. So it'll produce 0.5 moles per gm cubed of H plus ions. So when we're working out the pH of a diprotic acid, it's really important that we're quoting the concentration of H plus ions, not just the acid. So here, obviously, we've got twice as many H plus ions per acid molecule. So it's going to be 0.5 that goes in there. And obviously, that gives you a pH of 0.3 there. Really, just be really, really careful with this. A lot of the time, some people look at that and just say, oh, it equals the same. Put the number in and they'll get it wrong. So just make sure you're taking into account that. Obviously, your triprotics as well. So phosphoric acid, obviously, is multiplied by three instead. So similar, I think you get the idea. So it's a similar, uh, similar process. Okay, so let's have a look at calculating the pH of strong bases here. So obviously, similar to strong acids, when you're calculating the pH of strong bases, bases, make sure you assume they dissociate fully. So let's have a look at the example. Or we assume, sorry, they dissociate fully. So... Here is an example of a strong base. So your, for example, sodium hydroxide, that will dissociate to form Na plus and OH minus ions. And most strong bases, they actually dissociate to produce one OH minus ion for every base molecule. So for every one of these, you get an OH minus ion. And this means obviously the concentration of base equals the concentration of OH minus ions. Very similar to what we're saying with an acid. Now to calculate the pH of a base, we still need the H plus ions, we still need to uh, calculate the concentration of H plus ions. And to get this, we need to use a different equation called an ionic product of water expression, so Kw. So Kw is the concentration of H plus multiplied by the concentration of OH minus ions. So to work out the concentration of H plus, which is this, we need to know what Kw is, and we need to know what the concentration of OH minus ions are. Now, at a specific temperature, so make sure, obviously, the temperature will be given. The value can change depending on the temperature. So once we know the H plus value, we can then obviously work out pH using the equation that we've seen before. So, for example, let's look at calculating the pH of 0.15 moles per dm cubed of sodium hydroxide solution at 298 Kelvin. So Kw is one times by 10 to the minus 14, so that's fixed at room temperature, so at 298 Kelvin, so that makes it a bit easier. So what we have to do is substitute the figures into the Kw expression. So we've got um, one times 10 to the minus 14 equals the concentration of H plus times by 0 0.15. And then secondly, we rearrange the expression to find the concentration of H plus. So H plus is obviously 1 times 10 to the minus 14 divided by 0.15. So we've just shifted that around to get H plus the subject. And then that tells us the concentration of H plus. Now we've got that, we then need to put that into the pH equation to work out what the pH is. So pH is minus log concentration of H plus ions and that gives a pH of 13.18. Check this value. Obviously we're talking about sodium hydroxide, it's a base, so we would expect it to be close to 14, in which case it is. If you're getting a figure that's suggesting two or one, something's gone wrong because we know it's a base, so this pH has got to be um, towards 14, okay, because that's obviously the on the pH scale. Okay, so we've looked at strong acids and we've looked at strong bases and we looked at the formulas we can use for that. But we're going to introduce a, um, a different constant here, which is the acid dissociation constant, Ka. Now, Ka is used when we don't have a strong acid. So, in other words, we're going to use a weak acid instead. There we are. And now, weak acids only dissociate slightly. So, remember we said at the start, strong acids will dissociate fully. Weak acids dissociate slightly. So in aqueous solution, we have to use this different constant to work out their pH values. So for strong acids, like you say, we could assume that the concentration of H+, plus, especially for monoprotic acids, of course, um, we can assume that the concentration of H plus ions equals the concentration of acid for strong acids. And we can't do this for weak acids. So we use Ka. Um, now, weak acids exist in this equilibrium, so very similar to strong acids, except 
that one assumption is that obviously that only a small amount of the weak acid HA actually dissociates. So in a strong acid, all of this, we assumed all of this breaks down to form H plus and A minus. But here we can't make that assumption. So we can say that the concentration of HA at equilibrium is approximately the same as the concentration of HA at the start of the reaction. So right at the start, when we had 100% of this, is roughly about the same as what it is at equilibrium. And obviously the equilibrium law can be applied here as we have an equilibrium reaction. Um, so we can use the Ka expression to represent the reaction as well. So there we are. So Ka equals, obviously this is the units of this is moles per decimeters cubed, but basically it's products divided by reactants. So it's the concentration of H plus, concentration of A minus, divided by the concentration of HA at the start. Remember, we've assumed this is roughly the same as what it is at equilibrium, which is basically what we're measuring. So the second assumption we make is that the dissociation of the acid here is greater than the dissociation of water present in solution. So we can assume that any H plus ions that are knocking around in solution have actually come from the acid and not from the water that's actually been dissolved in. So we can say that the concentration of H plus ions here are about the same as the concentration of A minus because obviously to get this you need to have this and vice versa. So that's the other assumption that we make with um, with this react with this obviously expression here. So what we can do is simplify this K expression and put it to this. So we'd say Ka equals concentration of H plus squared divided by the concentration of HA, which is your acid. Okay, so we can use the K expression to calculate the pH of a weak acid. So let's have a look through this. So let's calculate the pH of 0 0.03 moles per dm cubed of ethanoic acid at 298 Kelvin. So the Ka for ethanoic acid is 298 Kelvin is 1.76 times by 10 to the minus 5 moles per decimeter cubed. So the first thing we need to do is write down our Ka expression. So Ka equals H plus squared, because we assume that H plus and A minus is equal, um, divided by the concentration of ethanoic acid, because obviously that's your weak acid. So then we need to rearrange the equation to calculate um, H plus squared, because that's what we want to work out. Remember, if we're working out the pH, we need to know how much of the, the H plus we've got. So H plus squared equals Ka times the concentration of ethanoic acid. We put the figures in and we get the concentration of H plus squared to be 5.28 times by 10 to the minus 7. Now, we need to work out what the concentration is of just H plus signs. So we must square root this value here Okay, to get the concentration of H+, plus, that gives us 7.27 times by 10 to the minus 4 moles per decimeters cubed. And then finally, we can calculate the pH. So pH is the minus log of H+, plus, and we've got a pH of 3.14. Again, check the answer. This is a weak acid, so we'd expect it to be around about 3 or 4, somewhere around there. And this is exactly what we've got, so that's that looks fine to me. Okay, so we can use this K expression to calculate the Ka or concentration of a weak acid as well. So let's have a look at this example. So we're going to calculate the concentration in moles per decimeter cubed of methanoic acid at 298 Kelvin with a pH of 3.14 and the Ka for methanoic acid at 298 Kelvin is 1.77 times by 10 to the minus 4 moles per decimeters cubed. So here we're going to kind of, we're just um, calculating something different to what we've mentioned before. So the first thing we need to do is calculate the concentration of H plus ions using the pH equation. So pH equals minus log to the base 10 of H plus ions. Rearrange that to get this. Remember that's the shift and log button to, to get that. So we're going to put in 10 to the minus 3.14, because that's what we've been given. And that gives us a concentration of 7.24 times by 10 to the minus 4, the concentration of H plus ions. So write down the Ka expression. There it is there. Okay, so we know this bit. And actually, we know this bit as well, because we've been told 
what that is there. That's the strength. So we're going to put all this into the equation. We're going to rearrange it because remember we're wanting to work out the concentration of um, method. Oh, sorry, that's the Ka. So we, we want to work out this bit here, the concentration. Sorry about that. So concentration of methanoic acid. So we're going to rearrange that and we're going to get H plus squared divided by Ka. There's your H plus squared. That's what we've just worked out before. Divided by 1.77 times by 10 to the minus 4. Um, and this gives you the concentration of methanoic acid to be 2.96 times by 10 to the minus 3 moles per decimeters cubed. So, calculating Ka um, is basically just steps 1 and 2. So you just do exactly the same. Um, and then you just substitute your numbers in. You don't actually need to rearrange it at all. So Ka is basically just the concentration of H+. Plus divided by the concentration of your weak acid, and that basically will tell you what the value of K is. So, pretty straightforward. Okay, so, um, let's have a look at KW, okay, which is obviously the ionic product of water, and we've kind of looked at bits of this already, but we're going to kind of go through it um, a little bit more detail. So, obviously, water exists in equilibrium as well. So, when you look at a glass of water, you don't just have... Um, sorry, you don't have, just have loads of water molecules in there. You actually have um, ions floating around in there. So, water dissociates into hydroxide ions and hydroxonium ions, as we can see in this equation. So, that's normally how it exists in water. Now, we can simplify it by doing H2O um, with produce H plus ions and OH minus ions. Now, the equilibrium law um, can be applied here um, as we have an equilibrium reaction. And you can see there, so you've got product over um, reactant, as you can see there. So that's the Kc expression. But water doesn't actually dissociate very well. It's quite weakly dissociates, actually. So we don't produce that many H plus and OH minus ions in comparison to H2O. As I've mentioned before, um, water is it doesn't really dissociate very well. So we can assume that the concentration of water has a constant value. And so for that reason, we can just kind of ignore that. So we need another expression to represent this neat, unique property. And if we multiply the two constants, K, Kc and the concentration of water, we get a new constant and we call it Kw. And this is the ionic product of water. Okay, And the units of this are mole squared dm to the minus 6. There it is. Okay, so Kw equals concentration of H plus multiplied by the concentration of OH minus ion. So this is the ionic product of water. Now we'd seen this before when we used it to work out the um, the, the concentration of a base. So we use the Kw expression. This is basically just saying where it's come from. And obviously the reason why we call it water is obviously because we're looking at the equilibrium of water which produces both of these ions here. So this is the expression that we've just seen before. So some important points related to the value of Kw. Um, so the value of Kw is the same in a solution at a given temperature. So it doesn't actually change. Obviously the temperature will change it, but in terms of that, it's always going to be fixed. Kw has a value of 1 times by 10 to the minus 14 mole squared dm to the minus 6. Make sure you remember that. It's really important. And obviously, like I mentioned before, if the temperature changes, the value of Kw changes as well. So pure water um, has got an equal split of H plus and OH minus ions, which is kind of obvious because you can't have H plus ions without OH minus ions because they're both derived from the same water molecule. So therefore, we can assume that the concentration of H plus ions in from water is the same as the concentration of OH minus ions. And so when we're referring to pure water, we can actually write the Kw's expression as H plus squared. It's as simple as that. PKW, and you might see this, um, you might see this as well, um, you know, in your exam, but PKW is calculated from Kw and it's just calculated using the following um, equations. So for example, PKW is the minus log of Kw. And so therefore, Kw is basically 10 to the minus of PKW. Now, this might look familiar because actually, if you look at pH, the little p 
effectively it's not not direct link but the p is means minus log of something so this is the minus log of kw so ph is the minus log of h plus ions so that's what the little p I suppose you can kind of remember it like that the little p just means the minus log of something and this is just like the ph equation except we're putting kw in there instead of h so pkw is used to display kw values on a much smaller scale so it's handy for when you're drawing a graph instead of getting a graph with huge variation in numbers putting anything in a log scale makes the kind of figures proportionate to each other so you still get the same shape graph but it means it condenses it down into numbers which are a lot more manageable and allow you to plot the results much more accurately so you know those who do maths will probably appreciate that's what um that's what a logarithmic scale does it tries to kind of condense it down into into something which is uh, more manageable and easier to plot Okay, so let's see how we can calculate pKa. So, like I say, it's it's another pKa is just another way of measuring the strength of an acid, similar to pH. And obviously, the lower the value, the stronger the acid. There's no difference really between pKa and pH in terms of what it's measuring. So, remember, pKa is the minus log of the value of Ka. And so, to calculate the pKa value for an acid with a Ka value of 7.52 times by 10 to the minus 3. Again, relatively straightforward, if I'm honest. So pK is just the minus log of Ka, and so therefore the value of pK is 2.12. Now, to work out what Ka is, we just do 10 to the minus of pK, so it's that shift log, and then you put minus the pK value in. So let's have a look at an example. So we're going to calculate the pH of 0 0.0250 moles per decimeters cubed of ethanoic acid at 298 Kelvin, which has a pKa value of 4.75 at 298 Kelvin. Sorry, excuse me. Um, so the first one, um, so calculate Ka. So the first thing is Ka equals 10 to the minus pKa. So Ka is times by, uh, is 10 so that's shift log and then minus 4.75 because that's what they're giving you there and that gives you a Ka value of 1.78 times by 10 to the minus 5 moles per decimeters cubed and then secondly we need to calculate the value of H plus from the Ka expression okay because remember we want to work out pH so Ka equals the concentration of H plus squared divided by the concentration of ethanoic acid so we need to rearrange this to get h plus squared so h plus squared again it's ka multiplied by your concentration of ethanoic acid put your numbers in there and that should give you that value remember this is squared so we need to take the square root of that to get the concentration of h plus and that gets us 6.67 times by 10 to the minus 4 moles per decimeters cubed and then finally, we need to calculate the pH. So pH is the minus log of H plus ions. Obviously, you put your numbers in there and you should get a pH of 3.17. Again, check the value. Does that look sensible? Well, we've been told that we have ethanoic acid. So that's a weak acid. We would expect it to be about pH 3 or 4 because it's a weak acid. So that makes sense. That fits. Always check these numbers. Never just work out a number and just say, well, I don't really know what it means. This is the pH of a weak acid, so we'd expect it to be there. Okay, so we're going to move on to something a little bit tricky here. Um, and this is buffers. Now, buffers um, is a chemical that resists the change in pH when small amounts of acid or base are added. Okay, remember this is resisting they don't stop the change of ph they just resist it from changing okay so it's not preventing it from happening and there's two types of buffers that we need to be aware of and this is acidic buffers and basic buffers and we're going to go through each one of them so let's look at acidic buffers so basically a buffer is something which effectively resists the change in ph if we add something to it so um they resist the change in pH, or acidic buffers resist the change in pH in order to keep the solution below pH 7. And that's, um, by definition, something which is acidic. They're made from a weak acid and a salt of its conjugate base. 
So for example, um, an acidic buffer is using ethanoic acid, so that's your weak acid, and its salt. So its salt would be something like sodium ethanoate. This, these two together in a beaker creates an acidic buffer. Okay, you must have this, you must have this kind of set up here. It's got to be um, its salt. In any buffer solution, there's two equilibrium equations at play. Okay, and the two will actually coexist in the same beaker. Um, this gets a bit complicated because obviously we're going to talk about a lot of different kind of equilibrium reactions here. And hopefully I'm going to try and make this as clear as I possibly can because this can be really tricky. So here we've got our weak acid here, which is um, ethanoic acid. There's the ion that it will form on H+. So this is it dissociating. Now we know that weak acids dissociate weakly. So we have effectively a high concentration of this and a very low concentration of these two here. So equilibrium is lying well over to the left in its own right. Its salt, on the other hand, is obviously dissociates strongly, if not all of it. Um, so the equilibrium lies well over to the right. So if we add this into solution, it will dissociate to produce loads of this and loads of that. So these concentration comments below are going to be really, really important when we're looking at trying to describe what a buffer does. So what happens when we add an acid, so that's H plus, to this buffer? Well, let's have a look. So the H plus ions, imagine these will, these two will exist in tandem. Imagine you've got that reaction and that reaction happening in the same beaker. Okay, you've got both of these happening. So we add H plus ions, um, and H plus ions will react with the CH3 COO minus ions in solution. Okay, so we know that's what will happen. It'll go for this negative charge. You've got a little bit here, but the majority of it's coming from the salt. There's a high concentration of these from the salt, as you can see, and effectively more CH3 COOH is produced. So the H plus will react with this. There's loads of this knocking around in solution um, and that will form this okay so you'll get more of CH3COOH and so equilibrium effectively shifts to the left if we had to kind of put these side by side it's moving to the left hand side of this equation here remember these are working in tandem with each other okay and other separate equations but they're happening in exactly the same beaker so we can interchange them like that so what happens when we add a base to this buffer which is OH minus well the OH minus ions will react with the H plus ions in here so they'll react with that and they could react with this but if you think about it sodium reacting with sodium ions reacting with hydroxide ions will form sodium hydroxide which will dissociate very quickly uh, and basically produce these two ions back again so that's not really that much good so it will react with this though and change the kind of chemistry of what you've got. Now, the problem is there's not many of these in solution. So when the OH minus ions react with the um uh, when the OH minus ions react with the H plus ions, these have to be reproduced. So equilibrium will actually shift to the right. So it'll go this way. So this will dissociate further to replace the H plus ions that have been lost to um, obviously by the hydroxide ions. And this is obviously on the basis of Le Chatelier's principle, which you've seen in year one. And so equilibrium shifts to the right to replace that. Now, you can see this is quite complicated. There's a lot going on here. You've got to be comfortable with all of this here because we're gonna go into some calculations in a minute, um, which is gonna be reliant upon you understanding this bit here, okay? So hopefully, this should make sense. If not, go through it again and, and make sure you've got it. Okay, so um, acidic buffers can also be made from an excess weak acid and a strong base as well. So we make it in two ways. So an example of an acidic buffer is using ethanoic acid. So CH3COOH, that's a weak acid. And we can react that with sodium hydroxide. And basically all the, of the base reacts with the acid in the following way. So we've got um, your weak acid there and there's your base. That's your hydroxide ions from the base. And that will form your um, ethanoate ions, which are here, and water. 
Now here, we have an excess of ethanoic acid. We've got loads of this. So we'll still have some left over after all of the OH- ions have reacted. We've got loads of this. Okay, Remember, it's an excess weak acid. So um, in our beaker, we have a mixture of weak acid. So some of this. We have its salt, okay, which is this bit here. So we've got the ions from there. Um, and we've got water. So effectively, we have all the kind of beginnings of a buffer. And because there's still some weak acid in there, it partially dissociates to form this as well. So we've got this from the weak acid. We have loads of this because that's been formed from the hydroxide ions. Um, and obviously, we've, we've got some water in there as well. So this can also create a buffer solution as well. It's just in a slightly different way. So just be aware of what these acidic buffers are. Okay, so moving on to basic buffers. So basic buffers, they resist the change in pH, just like acids do, but they keep the solution, try to keep the solution above pH 7. Um, and they're made, surprise, surprise, from a weak base and its salt. So let's have a look. So a basic buffer um, is ammonia. For example, ammonia, which is NH3, so that's the weak base. And its salt is ammonium chloride, so NH4 plus Cl minus. So if we mix these together, we get a buffer. And obviously in any buffer, as we've seen before, we have two equilibrium equations at play. So the two equations, remember, they coexist in the same beaker, and that's how we can interchange between them. So let's have a look. Here's your weak base. Um, this obviously reacts with water to form the ammonium ions and OH minus ions. Because it's a weak base, we have a high concentration of ammonia and we don't have much ammonium ions or OH minus ions at all. So equilibrium is lying well over to the left. Okay, and then the salt, um, the salt will dissociate quite readily. Obviously, it's dissolved in solution, so you'll get high amounts of ammonium ions and you'll get high amounts of Cl minus ions. You won't get many ammonium chloride um, molecules because these will dissociate fully. So equilibrium lies well over to the right on this occasion. Okay, so let's go through the same concepts as what we've done with our acidic buffers. So what happens when we add a base, which is OH minus ions to this buffer? So see if you can have a think. Where do you think the OH minus ions will react with out of all of these reactants, are these products here? Well, the OH minus ions are actually going to react with the ammonium ions in solution. Okay, so it's the NH4 plus ions. So that's negative. So that's going to go for something which is positive. Luckily, we have a large amount of um, ammonium ions. We've got a high concentration of these produced predominantly, obviously, from the salt. Um, and because um, if we add more OH minus ions, these will react and use up the ammonium ions. Um, and that will shift equilibrium um, obviously, we produce more NH3 and H2O is produced. Obviously, we've got loads of these. These will react and we'll get produce more of these products here. So, equilibrium will shift to the left. Now, what happens when we add acid to this? Well, the H plus ions are going to go for the OH minus ions, and we don't really have a large amount of these at all. So, what's going to happen? Um, obviously we don't have a lot of them so they're going to have to be remade or replaced because they're being used up so equilibrium will actually shift to the right in this case okay so that moves to the right the NH3 and H2O will be used up to replace the OH miners that have been lost or reacted um, to, to form this okay Let's look at some titration curves and buffers. Um, now, you would have seen titration curves in year one. This is really looking at um, the buffers, the, the buffer side of it first. So, obviously, we can see evidence of buffer action in a titration curve. So, if we see here, remember you've got pH here and you've got a, um, a conical flask or something down here, and then you've got a burette, and then you're adding obviously acid in this case, it's going to be a weak acid, is going to be in the burette, uh, and then we're going to add um, an, a strong base into this into this solution here. So obviously, we add it, and initially, the pH changes, um, or the pH changes quickly as there's loads of OH minus ions 
from the strong base to react with the H plus ions from the weak acid. Okay, so that's right at the start. Initially, it starts off pretty quickly. Then what happens is that over time, the curve then becomes more level. And what's happening here is we're, we're creating that buffer solution. Okay, so the buffer solution, eventually we're adding a strong base, okay, to this weak acid and a buffer solution is being created. So remember what it's doing is just trying to resist the change in pH, okay. There comes a point though when actually um, you start to run out of acid molecules because the acid molecules are reacting with the OH minus ions and you all keep adding them up adding them in it gets to a point where you run out of acid molecules um, and it's at this point when you've used all the acid molecules up they've all reacted and then it just collapses so the OH minus ions are in excess of any acid molecule that's left we get a very sharp rise in pH at this point and this at this point here this is called the equivalence point so this is where um, effectively the buffer is broken and the concentration of acid to OH minus ions is the same so this is the equal and obviously when you add more OH minus ions um, obviously that then definitely makes it um, a strong base so just making sure that you know that this bit here this bit is the evidence of buffer action at the start and at this point the vertical bit of the graph this is where um, obviously the buffer is eventually broken at that point Okay, so let's have a look at some of the uses of um, buffers. So obviously buffers have a lot of uses. Um, that's obviously in household products or naturally occurring in living things. Um, so a good example is blood. Um, obviously buffers are, are, are actually everywhere, to be honest. Um, mainly in, like say, in food products as well. If you think of, um, normally actually they call them stabilizers. If you see them on the back of, say, ready meals or things like that, they're called stabilizers. It's effectively a buffer that's what it is and it stops um you know food from going off too quickly it tries to regulate the ph and make sure that it stays as fresh as it can be for as long as possible um but blood definitely has one so it's obviously vital to make sure your blood uh, ph is maintained as close to 7.4 as possible um and obviously our body systems really need it to be 7.4 if it doesn't your cells won't function in the normal way and you you suddenly feel quite ill actually so um our body systems rely on this so a buffer is actually present in the blood and carbon dioxide plays a massive role in um kind of creating this buffer solution so we have um our carbonic acid and hydrogen carbonate system exists so you can see here we've got um your HCO3 will produce the H plus ions and HCO3 minus. So that dissociates quite weakly. And then you've also got this, um, this equilibrium as well that exists here. And effectively, um, your carbonic acid, which is H2S, H2SO4, H2CO3 is actually controlled by respiration in your cells. So we breathe out um, carbon, or when we breathe out the carbon dioxide, and the level of carbonic acid reduces, okay, so carbonic acid remembers H2CO3, so that reduces that amount there as equilibrium shifts right to try and replace some of these, um, uh, the, the, well, that's the H2CO3, so when we breathe that out, obviously the concentration of that reduces, so this shifts right to replace some of the carbon dioxide that's been, um, that's been obviously breathed out. So hydrogen carbonate, HCO3 minus, um, this bit here is controlled by kidneys and obviously a lot of the excess of this is removed um, via kidneys as well. So what this is trying to do is buffer some of the changes in pH. And you might think, well, how does your blood pH change? When you think about it, there's a lot of um, different molecules moving in, in and out of your bloodstream, whether that's oxygen and whether that's carbon dioxide, it could be glucose molecules, you've got, um, you know, hormones that's rushing around. So there's a lot of things kind of like um, being introduced into the bloodstream and removed. And these things can have an impact on pH effectively. Um, so you've got to make sure that obviously the, this buffer system works quite well to ensure that your cells work in the normal way. Okay, so this is where we're going to look at some calculations. And here we're going to calculate the pH of a buffer. 
So to calculate the pH of a buffer, we need to know the Ka value and the concentration of the weak acid and its salt as well. So let's have a look at this example. So we're going to calculate the pH of a buffer that contains 2.35 times by 10 to the minus 2 moles of methanoic acid and 1.84 times by 10 to the minus 2 moles of sodium methanoate in a 1 decimeter cubed solution. So the value of Ka at 25 degrees Celsius for methanoic acid is 1.78 times by 10 to the minus 4 moles per decimeters cubed, as you can see on there. So let's write out the equation and the Ka expression first. So here's the equation. So this is methanoic acid, and that will produce H plus ions and your um, ions, your hydrogen carbonate ions, uh, sorry, your um, methanoate ions here. Your Ka expression is H plus, um, and obviously HCO or minus, your methanoate ions. So these are your products divided by your reactants, which are at the bottom there. So in buffers, um, what you've got to notice here is that unlike in the previous examples where we want to work out the strength of an acid, uh, or the, the strength of a, the, sorry, the pH of a weak acid, we assumed that the, these and these were the same and we can just put H plus squared. When we're referring to buffers, we cannot do that and we've got to keep these constituents separate. Okay, so we can't use this equation here. It's really important. Whenever it's talking about buffers, keep them separate like that. Okay, we can't assume that there. So we must use as well equilibrium concentrations here, not initial concentrations. Okay, so we've got to look at this at equilibrium. Once the reaction's set away, it'll establish equilibrium, and the values that we use here must be at equilibrium. Okay, so we can assume that um, salts um, dissociate fully, okay, and weak acids dissociate poorly. So the concentration of the salt that we're using is basically equal to the concentration of A minus, which is this bit here, okay, um, and the concentration of the acid at the start is equal to the concentration of the acid at equilibrium. So when it's talking about the concentration of methanoic acid, okay, which is um, obviously um, this bit here, then we can assume that the concentration there is going to be the same at equilibrium. So there's a few assumptions that we're making here when we're doing these calculations. Okay, then once we've done that, we need to rearrange the expression to get H plus, or the concentration of H plus on its own. So the concentration of H plus is Ka times by the concentration of methanoic acid divided by the concentration of methanoate ions. Now here, we've got the number of moles in the question, okay? So you can see here we've got moles of this and moles of that. Now that's no good. We need to have them in concentrations because this is what the expression is telling us to do. With This means concentration of um, these uh, of the acid here, not the number of moles. So to work out concentration, we need to do concentration as moles divided by volume. Remember, this was in um, year one chemistry. And in this case, um, in this example, it is moles divided by one decimeters cubed, okay? Because the volume that we're using here is decimeters cubed. So in this case, we can say that actually the number of moles here, if you divide that number by one, you're just gonna get that number again. So we can, in this example, we can say that the number of moles is the same as the concentration of each of them as well. So the concentration, uh, sorry, the value of Ka is 1.78 times 10 to the minus 4. We've been given that. The concentration of methanoic acid is 2.35 times 10 to the minus 2, which is there. And the concentration of methanoate ions is 1.84 times 10 to the minus 2, because we've been told it there. Okay, so we put all that in and we get the concentration of H plus to be 2.27 times by 10 to the minus 4. Okay, and then the fourth bit we need to do is obviously calculate the pH of this buffer and we do pH is the minus log of H plus, put the numbers in and we get a pH of 3.64. Okay, so that's what we're doing here. You've got to be aware of these assumptions. We're going to use these assumptions for the um, next um, for well for any type of pH or calculate the pH for buffer you've got to use these assumptions there it's really important okay so 
let's kind of move on to kind of the final parts of this, I suppose, or the final section of this topic, where we're going to look at solubility of products, some common ions, and um, stability as well. So looking at um, stability of, of solubility of, of stability in solution. So we're going to look at solubility product first. Okay, so solubility is the extent to which a solid dissolves in solution. Seems to make sense, doesn't it? So when ionic solids, when they're added to water, hydrated ions are present in aqueous solution. So you would have seen that um, in previous topics. So this would have been in uh, topic 23 when we looked at um, hydrated ions. So if you're not sure on that, go back and have a look at topic 23. So the degree of solubility obviously depends on the type of solid, but also the temperature and pressure that um, that exists as well. So there'll come a point where the, the water can no longer hold any more solid. And this is the point of saturation. And any additional solid added to this point won't dissolve. So you've seen this. If you add, say, salt to water, you can't just infinitely chuck as much salt in as you want into that water initially it'll start to dissolve it'll dissolve and then eventually there'll come a point where you add more salt and it just simply will not dissolve any further the additional salt you're adding so that is saturation point now the maximum amount of solid that will dissolve in a solvent is called solubility okay so that's the word we use solubility solubility that has the units of grams per decimeters cubed so it's the amount of salt you add per volume of liquid that you're adding it to, at which, what's the maximum amount you can add to that? It is temperature dependent, obviously, so if you take salty water and you warm that water up, it will hold more salt, it can dissolve more salt at that point. So you'll see all these things quoted with a specific temperature. So to get solubility in moles per decimeter cubed, all we do is we divide the grams per decimeter cubed by the molar mass of the solid that we're adding in. And we'll, we'll see an example here. So the solubility of barium sulfate at 298 Kelvin is 0 0.0025 grams per decimeter cubed. So let's give the solubility in moles per decimeter cubed instead. So molar mass of barium sulfate, okay, is BASO4. Using the periodic table, we get 233.4 grams per mole. Solubility is 0 0.0025, that's in grams per decimeter cubed, divided by the um, molecular mass, and that will give 1.07 times 10 to the minus 5 moles per decimeter cubed. So that's the solubility of barium sulfate at that temperature at 298 Kelvin. In a saturated solution, okay, um, we have the, the amount of barium 2 plus, uh, yeah, amount of barium 2 plus ions equals or the concentration sorry of barium two plus equals the concentration of sulfate ions okay so that's the same so therefore we can say that the concentration of these ions is also going to be 1.07 times by 10 to the minus 5 moles per decimeters cubed fairly straightforward not too taxing okay so just make sure you know that word solubility Okay, so we're going to look at a, a constant. It wouldn't be uh, it wouldn't be equilibrium without another constant, would it? So we're going to look at a constant called the solubility product. Okay, so this is the KSP. So obviously anything to do with this when we're dissolving things in water, an equilibrium is established between the ions that have been dissolved and the undissolved solid. Okay, so when sparingly soluble solids are dissolved in solution so when you do have a sparingly soluble solid so for example a solid that doesn't really dissolve very well you're going to have some undissolved solid i.e salt and some that has dissolved so this is the case when you have obviously the example that we looked at before is where you have a, um, a something that dissolves fully we can make that assumption that it all dissolves and therefore we can work out the solubility when you've got something that partially dissolves, we can't make that assumption. And this is where we're using KSP instead. So a bit like when we looked at pH and we said if you had a strong acid, we could assume that the concentration of H plus ions equals the concentration of the acid that we started with and therefore just chuck it in the pH equation. And then if we had a weak acid, we had to use Ka um, because we can't make that assumption. This is similar, except we're looking at solubility instead. So if you have something that's sparingly soluble, we can't just assume that the amount of solid 
uh, well, the concentration of solid is the same as obviously the, the concentration of the ions that's been formed. So if we've got a sparingly soluble solid, we need to use KSP. Okay. Um, now, um, a sparingly soluble solid of A, of AABB, which is this here, so this is just an example of a solid, dissolved to saturation, the following equilibrium is established. So effectively, there's our solid salt. We add it to solution and we form these two ions in solution here. So we've got a positive and a negative ion. And obviously, depending on obviously the number of these um, will depend on the number that goes in front. So we can apply the equilibrium constant, Kc, okay, to show how this looks. Remember, we don't include solids in this at all. We're just looking at aqueous solutions, okay, because we're looking at talking about solubility here. So Ksp is the equilibrium constant for a sparingly soluble product in a saturated solution, okay? So it's already saturated, and we've got something which is sparingly soluble, it doesn't dissolve very well. So it has the same formula as Kc, as I mentioned before. So Ksp, which is here, is basically the concentration of A, aqueous, um, multiplied by the concentration of B, aqueous. We're not including the solid here, okay? We're ignoring that, and that's why I've just put these two here. So Ksp, okay, which is the solubility product, has a fixed value for a specific solution and temperature, so it's always the same. So let's have a look um, at some further examples to do with solubility product. So KSP should always include state symbols in the expression. So using barium sulfate as an example, which is here, this is how we write an expression in terms of barium two plus ions and sulfate ions. So these are the ones that are formed when we add barium sulfate to water. Um, and we're gonna write, see how we write this expression. So KSP, which is Ba2 plus and SO42 minus, so that was kind of derived from the Kc expression, or this, okay, which is Ksp, solubility of BaSO42, okay, squared. Now, notice we're putting squared here, okay, because the concentration of each ion that the saturated solution, or in the saturated solution, equals the solubility of BaSO4, and we can square it. So remember, we've got these two being formed here, with both of these. So that and that, we assume is the same, and we say the solubility is basically that squared. Okay, so that's how we write it out. So just like for KC, we need to work out the units. Okay, and obviously these will vary according to the reaction that's obviously been conducted here. So Work out the units of the product. So let's have a look at a different example here. So let's work out the units of the product of um, Bi2S3. Okay, so we're going to use the KSP equation here. So we've got two lots of bismuth 3 plus and three lots of sulfur 2 minus. Okay, so you would have seen this in year one chemistry as well about how to write the units. But KSP is effectively moles per decimeters cubed squared multiplied by moles per decimeters cubed, cubed. So because we've got two and three there, so that effectively means it's moles per decimeters cubed to the power of five. And then basically if we expand that bracket out, we get mole to the five dm to the minus 15. Okay, so we can use KSP and this can be calculated by using your solubility value. So let's have a look at some um, calculation examples here. So calculate the solubility product of lithium carbonate, so that's Li2CO3, when the solubility of this is 13.3 grams per decimeters cubed at 20 degrees Celsius. So the first thing we need to do is write out the KSP expression. Okay, so remember we're only including aqueous ions here okay so the reaction is li2co3 s solid uh, will give two li plus and co3 two minus so the solubility product is lithium plus with a two next to it because we have two of them okay and then you've got co3 two minus and we've only got one of them so it's just that so that's the first thing is write out your expression and then we need to calculate solubility of Li2CO3 in moles per decimeters cubed. We've been given it in grams per decimeters cubed. We need to convert that into moles per dm cubed. So the solubility in moles per dm cubed is 
the solubility in grams to meters cubed divided by the MR. So that's 13.3. 74, obviously this is calculated from the periodic table. And then the solubility in moles per decimeters cubed is 0 0.180. So we know that one mole of Li2CO3, which is this here, okay, dissociates to produce two moles of Li, and we can see that there, and one mole of CO3 two minus ions at equilibrium. Okay, so this is the equilibrium setup here. So therefore, we can say that the concentration, okay, because remember we worked out the concentration of LiCO3, Li2CO3, the concentration of Li plus is going to be two times that. So it's two times 0 0.180. And obviously the concentration of CO3 is just going to be the same as the concentration of Li2CO3, which is 0 0.180. So then we now need to use these figures here to work out the um, uh, solubility product constant, Ksp. Um, so we put the figures in there that we've just worked out up here and we get 0 0.023. Units, really important. So here, obviously, we can use the go back to the original expression here so you've got moles per decimeters cubed squared as you can see there multiply by moles per decimeters cubed because of that one um that will give you overall mole dm cubed to the minus three cubed so that's mole three dm to the minus nine make sure you work your units out here you get a mark for doing that so just make sure you do really really important Okay, let's look at the common ion effect. Um, this is really straightforward, dead easy. Um, so the common ion effect is basically where we add we add an ion to a saturated solution. So kind of still in this kind of arena. Um, that is the same as one of the ions that's already present in there. Hence common, so common ion. Okay, so let's look at an example where we've got sodium chloride. Okay, and um, we're going to add sodium chloride, which is salt, to water until we form a saturated solution. Okay, so we've seen these examples already. So let's have a look at this reaction. So the reaction is in equilibrium and it's in solution. So we've got sodium chloride solid uh, in equilibrium in water to produce Ni plus and Cl minus ions. So we're producing our ions there. So let's say we add more Cl minus ions. We're not adding more salt, just the Cl minus ions to this saturated solution. What do you think will happen with respect to equilibrium? So we've got this equilibrium here. Okay, it's saturated. We're going to add more of these ions here. So it's a common ion. What are we going to, what do you think might happen? Well, Lichotilius principle, okay, equilibrium will shift to the left to use up the chloride ions that we're adding into that, to use up the excess. So what we'll see is actually, because this is at saturation point, we'll see a precipitate form. So we'll start and see NaCl, or sodium chloride, actually being formed. Um, and as a result, we'll have a lower concentration of Na plus ions. So this will start to decrease and we'll get more of this being formed. But because it's at saturation point, it will form a precipitate. So we've added a common ion, okay, which is the Cl minus ion to a saturated solution. So one of the ions in the solution is obviously the same as the one that's been added and that's why we call it a common ion. So obviously the common ion effect can also be applied to sparingly soluble substances in solution too. You've just got to have a saturation point and then you will see a precipitate has actually been, been formed at this point. And obviously in this case, it's going to be your salt. See, so relatively straightforward, not too difficult. Okay, so this is where we're going to look at another coefficient. Um, this one's not too bad actually it's relatively straightforward it's more descriptive this rather than um you know rather than too math heavy i suppose um so this is called um so this is called the partition coefficient or kpc um so the partition coefficient is the equilibrium constant between a substance ability to dissolve in two different solvents okay hmm, someone's interested so let's say we've got this beaker here, okay, and we have a beaker with an aqueous layer and we've got an ether, okay, which is just another solvent. It's just it's just not water. Now these two liquids are immiscible, okay, so they don't mix with each other. Now um, we obviously get the two layers and the less dense, um, whichever one is, has lower density, depending on what you're reacting, will sit on top of that, will, will sit on top basically. So in this case, the ether 
is has a lower density than water and so therefore the ether will sit on top of the aqueous layer in this example could be the other way around though but in this example that's what we've got so let's suppose we're going to add a substance so add chemical a and obviously this is the purple dots okay um that is soluble in both solvents okay so it'll dissolve in both but actually it's more soluble in the ether so you get more you get a higher concentration of chemical a in the ether layer rather than the aqueous layer so if we stir the mixture okay so we put the mixture in we give it a good stir what will happen is some of chemical a okay will cross over into the aqueous layer and vice versa at the same time at the same rate and we reach an equilibrium at that point okay so we're mixing up and mixing up and it'll start to reach an equilibrium as this suspension in each solvent is in equilibrium we can write an equilibrium constant see another constant um all because of equilibria how fascinating so um so you got kpc is basically it's dead straightforward this one concentration of a in the ether over the concentration of a in the water and that's with the kpc okay so we can calculate the partition coefficient okay which is this here kpc when a hundred centimeters cubed solution containing one gram of chemical a was shaken with 20 centimeters cubed of ether um, 0.9 grams of a transferred into the ether layer okay so all of it so one gram okay is in the um was in the water in 100 centimeters cubed we added 20 centimeters cubed of ether um shook it and 0.9 grams of the original chemical we added in moved into that ether layer so basically we just write the concentration of ether and this is in grams per centimeters cubed is 0.9 divided by 20 and that gives us that and then we work out the concentration of a in water which is going to be 0.1 grams divided by 100 and remember that all this is in equilibrium so if you had initially you had one gram 0.9 has moved into the ether so that leaves you with 0.1 in the aqueous layer divide that by 100 and that gives us 0.001 grams per centimeters cubed and then your coefficient partition coefficient um is obviously 0.05 0.45 sorry 0.045 divided by 0.001 equals 45 and that's your partition coefficient now we can obviously rule these obviously work out the units they're basically both equal so there's no difference there so the units cancel out so there are never any partition never any units for partition coefficients so you're just going to get a number like that Okay, so what affects the um, partition coefficient? What impacts the number, the value of it? So the value of that is governed by the relative polarities of the solute and the solvents. Okay, so the solvents is the aqueous and the ether layer, for example, and the solute is the chemical that we add into it that then dissolves in either both or one of the layers. So let's use a, a slightly different example here. So we're going to use an example, a specific example, I suppose, of bromine. Okay, and that's been added to a beaker of water, which is the aqueous layer. Now this time, and, and a, a solvent um, called CCl4. Okay, so that's tetrachloromethane, effectively. Um, so in this example, water is actually less dense, and so it will actually sit on the top layer okay um, with the ccl4 sitting at the bottom so bromine's brown as we know so i've kind of put the kind of dots on there to represent bromine molecules now you can probably see obviously from the diagram that bromine is definitely more soluble in ccl4 than it is in water so we have a higher concentration of bromine molecules in um, tetrachloromethane than we do in the aqueous layer so the intermolecular forces between bromine okay so between bromine molecules themselves is van der waals forces so these are weak forces remember if you go back to year one chemistry when you're looking at bonding and intermolecular forces van der waals forces are the weakest forces um so in between bromine molecules so ignore the solvents here at this stage just between bromine molecules um it's van der waals now the same forces um, exist between CCL4 molecules. So the solvent, CCL4, the molecules within the solvent will interact via van der Waals forces as well. So they're non-polar overall. 
Now, when we mix the solution, okay, so the intermolecular forces are broken between the CCL4 molecules, between them and the Br2 molecules. Um, now, these are replaced by forces similar in energy between CCL4 and Br2. And so the molecules, um, so the molecules, obviously the energy barrier is quite low. So in other words, imagine if you kind of imagine yourself take yourself off into um your kind of a molecule um and you're watching this happening so in the ccl4 um solvent you've got ccl4 molecules kind of interacting via van der waals between themselves you've got bromine molecules interacting via van der waals between themselves as well and then when they kind of mix when you mix them together they will form Br2 and CCL4 molecules will form van der Waals forces between themselves as well. There's no kind of other forces being produced. So we're breaking the van der Waals and forming van der Waals. So there's not much of an energy barrier there at all. However, there are additional um, stronger forces. There's two stronger forces between water molecules. So the aqueous layer, the water molecules will actually, so if we kind of move our eyes to the aqueous layer, um, they have van der Waals forces, but they also have permanent dipole-dipole and hydrogen bonding forces. So you've got two stronger intermolecular forces that exist between water molecules. Now, if um, you're adding bromine into that, you have to break these forces between the water molecules first, and then bromine will effectively um, form a... a a van der Waals force between the bromine water, bromine molecule and the water molecule, which is weaker than the forces that water has. So effectively, water is interacting with itself. It's got a really strong bond between the water molecules. Bromine rocks up and says, hey, I want to try and get involved with this. Um, the water molecule will look and think, well, the strongest force I can form with you, with the bromine molecule, is van der Waals that's it so why should i really do that when i can form a stronger bond with my fellow water molecules so effectively it's not a very favorable water it doesn't really see that as a good deal at all in that sense obviously don't speak like that in the exam but it's trying to kind of visualize what's going on here and clearly it's not an energetically favorable process at all so in essence the relative solubility of the solute and the two solvents will govern the size of the partition coefficients and therefore the strength of the intermolecular forces okay so obviously what what governs the size of this is obviously the intermolecular forces um, between the solute itself i.e between bromine molecules the two solvents okay so this is obviously between um water molecules and water molecules and ccl4 molecules and ccl4 molecules that's kind of bonding within themselves and obviously between the solute the bromine molecule that's coming in and the solvents and the respective solvents so obviously um the the key thing is that um, you're more likely to get solubility if the bonds that are broken are about the same as the bonds that have been formed when you add your solute in there Okay, so these are things which can affect the partition coefficient. So hopefully that makes a bit of sense. Okay, so there's a lot there. Okay, there's a lot. It's a quite a big topic. Um, like I say, this is just topic 25. The full range of year one and year two revision slides are available on Allery Chemistry. Click on the link. Um, sorry, just no, don't click the link. I'll tell you about that in a moment. Um, if you um, you know, have a look on the Allery Chemistry YouTube channel, the full range is there. Please uh, hit the subscribe button, that's what I'm going to say, um, just to show you support for this project. That'll be absolutely fantastic. The link to actually buy these PowerPoints, if you wish to purchase them, um, is in the description box below, and you'll be able to get a hold of them there. Like I say, they're great value for money, and you can kind of make revision notes from them as well, if you wish. Um, right, that's it then. Bye-bye.